I'm acknowledging this is a ridiculous thing I'm about to say, but I contend that Michelangelo's David is the single greatest artistic achievement by a human being in the history of the world. Hello, and welcome to Working with me, Dan Doriani, hosting a podcast where we explore faith, work, culture, and the way believers can make a difference in their corner of the world. My guest today is honestly one of my favorite people in the world, Russ Ramsey. He's a pastor. He's been a pastor for almost exactly 20 years. He's an author. He's written five books. I was delighted to read his book, Struck, a number of years ago, in which he, I'll say, marked out his path as just a very honest writer. Describes his experience of coming reasonably close to death through a very strange illness and what it was like to work through that. And it's... uh, Brutally honest at times, but beautifully honest, I would say. And that same kind of honesty shows up in the book we're going to talk about today, which is Rembrandt is in the Wind. A fascinating read, and I recommend it gladly. Russ, good to have you in conversation. It is great to be with you. Yeah, so this book is a pastoral and historical series of reflections on I'm going to say seven artists and then a married couple and then a cluster of artists, the Impressionists, Mm -hmm. would be a a reasonably good way to say it. So nine chapters, mostly about individuals, but also sometimes about a group or about two people uh, as well. So delightful to have you here. Let me just ask right away, why did you decide to um, go at things so honestly? You open up with Vincent van Gogh, who was so prolific and so troubled. Mm-hmm. An individual, paranoid, shouting, scaring people, uh, probably took his life, we're not quite sure, and dozens of self-portraits, and very, very early in the book, you point out that a couple of his most powerful and beloved and striking self-portraits are ones after he, in one of his worst periods of depression, cut off a piece of his ear. And the and the cell portraits don't turn away. They show the bandage on yeah. his ear. Why did you start the book like that? Why are you so interested in what you say in that page, wounds and beauty? Wounds aren't beautiful in themselves, but the story behind their healing is. Those are your words. Walk us through your thinking. One of the powers of art is that it uh, it's a form of storytelling that, that gets past the, the gates of our defenses. It's, it's like mm-hmm. a Trojan horse for truth. You know, you can, uh, you can engage somebody with a, with a poem or a song or a painting and quickly get to the heart of things uh, in, in a kind of a surprising way. And, that, and Van Gogh was a person who, who was very aware of this and the way that he painted and the way that he wrote and the way that he thought. Uh, one of the things that he said to his brother about a painting that he was trying to do of a bridge. It was just a painting of a bridge. And he said, I'm trying to get at something utterly heartbreaking. That's what he said. Bridges can be heartbreaking. You know, yeah, they, well, I agree with that. They, yeah. They can. And, and I think, I think part of it, part of what's happening when we're, in, when we're engaging with art and Van Gogh is, for me, is a, is a key in this, is that we're, we're getting to kind of a, a transcendent level of, of the human experience beyond just, you know, what you think or, or, you know, you're getting into to how we move through the world. And, and that particular painting of Van Gogh, actually, I'm sitting in my office and I've, I'm touching the frame of it right now with my hand. Not of, the bridge, the one with the bandaged ear. The, the bandaged ear, ear. yeah, yep, the self-portrait right. with bandaged ear. Yep. Um, is one of these paintings that I look at and think it kind of tells the story of, of not only the power of art, but the, but the dignity of personhood. And that is that, you know, here's this painting that captures his, his worst moment. Uh, r- really one of one of his lowest moments and one of the things he's known for like if people know Van Gogh they typically know that he painted Starry Night that he cut off his ear and and that he captured himself in that moment of of healing uh, it, of recovering from this 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 episode of great shame uh, the irony now is that it's a painting that nobody that I know could afford to buy right, um, right. it's of it's of incredible worth uh, uh, picturing somebody in in their most vulnerable condition and there's so much of the gospel that's just kind of wrapped up in in that picture for me. And and art just does that for me. It, it takes me into these places where you just see the, uh, the complexity of, of humanity and the, the, the mercy and the grace of God and the way that beauty is still there. 
Well, right. So, I mean, you, you, you write about several people who we would call tortured souls, certainly Van Gogh, Caravaggio, were two of them. And your approach, I think, is to say we can't, um, we can't move well and honestly. One of your three themes is truth and goodness and then also beauty, uh, as you say early in the book. So we can't move honestly unless we're open about the wounds of our lives. Yeah. Van Gogh was certainly a wounded man. He was in recovery, painted at a prolific rate after he got into the, I mean, it was like two or three a week after he started to get his health back. Well, yeah, for the, for the, last, um, for the last 90 days of his life, he painted an average of a painting a day. Yeah, and there, that's, and, the, that's and these aren't good. like watercolor sketches that go right, up on the fridge. Right. These are the ones we know. Yeah, right. Um, there are yeah. sunflowers. It's and not a preliminary sketch. Right, exactly. right. Exactly. So let me just talk about you for a minute. And, you know, you're an honest person. You always have been. Your writing is honest. We had a very honest conversation, I don't know, a month and a half ago about any yeah. number of things. It's just where you are. And I want to label something that uh, I would like you to comment on. That is, when you have a conversation, a friend of mine says, you, you have to ask, what level are we in? What level of honesty? One, two, three, four, five. And, and one is, how are you doing today? More good than bad, which means... There's complexity in my day, and I don't want to talk about it. That's a one. Uh, number two is too close to call, which means there's a lot of bad going on today, but I'm going to say it in a funny way, so don't press me, but I'm being a little more honest. And then number th- I'm going to call level three, uh, I'm awesome. My first baby was just born five weeks ago, and my wife couldn't get pregnant for so long. We're just beside ourselves with ecstasy. And level four is... Yeah, we might be too ecstatic because now that I think back on how ecstatic we are, I think maybe we had baby idolatry. You know, Rachel says, give me children or I'll die. Life isn't worth living if I have a child. And I've just been meditating a lot last. I mean, my joy, my excessive joy is maybe meditate. That's a four, right? <laughs> and number five is I'm afraid my, ch- my wife loves my child more than me and it's going to ruin our marriage after three and four. You you naturally start off at sort of a two point eight and go to three point seven in a hurry, <laughs> and the whole book is like this. I mean, it's a very honest book. So I want you to tell me why you're so honest, why you're so committed to honesty. Well, one, I I'm not wired for much else. Like I don't, yeah. I'm not that interested in um, in in a whole lot of superficiality. But two, I think the honesty is where the good stuff is. Uh, some of these stories, you know. It, there's there's that old that old um, <laughs> trope you don't want to meet your you don't really want to meet your heroes because um, mm-hmm. they're going to disappoint you. Right. Uh, in 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 writing about these artists, one of the commitments that I made early on was that there would be no hagiography in this book. That I would not. You know, a, a hagiography is a is a book about a saint to demonstrate why they're a saint. Yeah. So it's just the good stuff. It erases all the negatives. Right. 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 It's right. it's look how great this person is. It's a puff right. piece. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. My, so my commitments were no hagiography, and I have to love my subject. Okay, um, yep. So so no takedowns. Yep. And and uh, and in the process of doing that, th- the stories that there are to tell about these artists as I got to know them um, are sad stories, and they're tragic stories, and they're stories of people who are um, who are broken in some really profound and hurtful ways. Uh, and but I just think telling telling those those stories. In, in an unvarnished in as unvarnished a way as I can, uh, but also as with a storyteller's hat on, where I'm trying to lead the reader through an experience of of discovering this this part of these artists, um, that there's there's a lot of comfort that we draw in in knowing that we're not alone in the things that 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 sit in our hearts and plague us and cause us to wonder if we're somehow. Um, different or less than other people because of the things we know about ourselves that we don't as readily know about other people. And, um, so, I, so I want to get, I want to get to that stuff as quickly as I can. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes maybe to a fault. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's a fault. So let's talk a little bit about the big challenge you face in a book like this. And that is goodness, truth, and beauty. I, I love your goodness, which shows up in the love you have for your people, even when you're describing their failings in, in uh, really pretty painful detail. You don't despise them. So that makes it a, a delight to read. But it is hard to write about beauty. It's a little bit like writing f- restaurant reviews. Why, you know, <laughs> just go eat the food, man. 
I right. Mean, it's, you can't explain a tangerine to somebody who never ate a tangerine. Just eat it. Yeah. And how can you write a book, Russ, how can you write a book about paintings? Now, I will say in your defense that you put about 20, I don't know, 25 paintings in the middle of the book. So you can see some of the ones that we have uh, read about the most, maybe 30 even. And then at the beginning of each chapter, you have a black and white of some of the main paintings. But it's pretty hard to write a, a book about art, isn't it? Just go see it. Well, hard to write a book about the Grand Canyon, too. Yeah, right, right. right it's, hard exactly. to, it's hard to write a book about uh, a perfectly aged prime rib, you know. Right. And yet, there's something in them, in these things that, that are beautiful, uh, that that have inherent meaning attached to them. Uh, it's the reason why we why we will give up our vacation days and go halfway around the globe to stand in front of a statue that was carved. Uh, 500 years ago is mm-hmm. because there's something inside of us where there's a kind of a communication that happens between people made in the image of our creator and a creator who is capable of the things that he, the splendor and the glory that he made, that is a language that is that kind of belongs to beauty. And so in writing about art, one of the things that, that was a goal of mine was I want to try to write about art in a way that would help people who feel intimidated by it who feel like, oh, I don't get art. I don't, I don't understand it. To say, oh, it's just storytelling. Let me just tell you stories, um, because we're all, we're, we're all gatherers of stories. We we, mm. we carry stories. We we make sense of the world through stories. Jesus taught with stories. It was his primary mm-hmm. method of teaching. And you know, I I think that the power there of that of the storytelling and and it, wanting to invite people into engaging art without fear. Uh, is something that was that was a hope of mine, and so some of the paintings are that are more familiar than others. But I wanted to try to describe them pu- purely in a storyteller's voice, so not in a his- not in an academic sort of way, but in in a in a way where where hopefully in reading about them, you you then want to turn to the middle section of the book and see it, yeah, um, right. And then you want to make the connections, and then you want to learn kind of this vocabulary, this visual vocabulary of how to look at art. To, to to where you're eventually beginning to to read it like you would read a poem or you would read a, a chapter. Right. That's definitely something that you make a prominent theme in the book, and that is learning how to read. For example, I'll go to Caravaggio, The Calling of St. Matthew. I mean, you teach us how to read. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like uh, you try to load five minutes into the – like Caravaggio tried to load five minutes of events into the painting – <laughs> and then you walk us through that. But well, I don't want to. Maybe we talk about Caravaggio, or, or maybe Michelangelo. Who who would you like to go to first, Caravaggio or Michelangelo? Well, let's start with uh, let's start with Michelangelo. Okay, very good. So he was a quarrelsome, vain, temperamental, freakishly talented man who worked very hard. He didn't like to paint because it was just too easy for him. Yeah, yeah. And so sculpting was much more of a challenge. So one of the most uh, supremely talented people, and, and as as you tell it, I'm just going to use your words, a man of faith and yet also a man who lived a carnal lifestyle and almost certainly a homosexual, but um, a man who wanted to love God and live for God, but also lived at odds with that to a significant degree. Yes? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And then he and then he gives us uh, Michelangelo, and there's this story. A lot of us have heard it, but I, you know, tell us why you're drawn to to describing this impossible piece of marble that he the statue used. of David. Yeah, right, exactly. But it's it's yeah. out of this t- ridiculously difficult piece of marble. Yeah. So he, <laughs> one of my contentions when I whenever I am invited to speak on Michelangelo, um, one of the things I'll just kind of throw out on the front end, and I'll say this for your for your listeners is uh, because one, I'm gonna I'm acknowledging this is a ridiculous thing I'm about to say. Okay. So I know it is, but I contend that Michelangelo's David is the single greatest artistic achievement by a human being in the history of the world, in the history of humanity. It's in the book. I read that. Yeah. yeah You're not yeah, shocking yeah. me. You're shocking our listeners. But right. And 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 uh, and my reasons for that are are and uh, I'm speaking purely artistic achievement. Right. Um. And my reasons for that are it's it's longevity. Uh. It it has stood around as one of the most recognized statues for over 400 years. It has its own rotunda. Um, yeah. So don't bring me the Pieta or or something else. Even though Michelangelo did that too. It's right. it has its own building. 
um, this this particular sculpture. But but also for Michelangelo, sculpture trumped painting because it was three dimensional instead of two, and for him, sculpting out of stone was the way to go because if you were working with clay or copper or whatever you can always add to you can make mm-hmm. mistakes and correct them but yeah, with he wanted stone, to make it as he wanted the degree of difficulty to be as high as possible as high as possible and right. so with stone it was pure subtraction there's no right. adding back uh, yep. so you can't make a mistake and then and then third um the the naked human form uh is the most challenging thing to sculpt accurately uh mm-hmm. to get that right because if you get it wrong it's obvious Right. Uh, it, if you do a it, fish wrong, you, people don't don't have that knowledge of fish. Right, fish, or if or if the person is wearing a robe, right? Yeah, you right, don't right. have to worry about muscular musculature or proportion or right. things like that. So David is this perfect statue carved of stone in in three dimensions, and it's enormous. It's it stands thirteen feet tall without its pedestal, seventeen feet tall with its pedestal. Um, it was carved from a stone that two other stonemasons had worked on before him. And so he inherited a stone where some work had already been done, which which made it so that David had to stand the way that he's standing. Yeah, right. And, he, he was forced into certain decisions by yeah, other people's yeah. acts. Right, acts, and yeah. which is the story of all of our lives, right, is that we right. all kind of are, are building on the work of those who have come before us. and we're Even having to bad work. <laughs> but yeah, we have to accommodate decisions people made and right. good things they did and, and challenging things that we have to then work around. And, and uh, you know, we wouldn't have Michelangelo's David as we know it had those right. other two sculptors not been working on it. And, um, and not always but, well. Right. The the sculpture itself is just is a marvel to me. I wouldn't say it's even in my top five favorite works of art in the world. It's just a marvel to me of, mm-hmm. of what he did with that yeah. thing. So you're distinguishing between your affection and your admiration. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have. Yeah. I have a lot of. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of things that I have deep affection for that I know are not regarded historically as the cream of the crop. But for me, right. they, they, it's meaning. Yeah. It's all about right. meaning and how they fit into my story. But also, there's. Uh, and I'm going to go to Caravaggio here in a minute because yeah. we just talked about it. But you also pointed out in the book that the sculpture has uh, captured the moment before his victory. Yes. That tells a variety of aspects of the story, namely his cleverness, I'll let people read the book, and also the tension before the moment. So, you know, after the victory, you know, with his head, everybody likes to do the head of Goliath, yeah. right? The severed head in David's hands. But then it's kind, it's kind of inert. I mean, it's a celebration, but he's captured the tension. Right, right. It's a, it's a sculpture of what happened. Mm-hmm. And Michelangelo's sculpture is a sculpture of David. Mm-hmm. The the narrative is you're lo- like the anger in David's mm-hmm. eyes and Michelangelo's yeah. David that is just unreal. Mm-hmm. Like to to see the way that he he captured that mm-hmm. out of stone and then you but you know you look at somebody like Donatello's sculpture of David right um, and it's you know it, he's got the head of Goliath on the ground and there's just there's nothing to see here it's already <laughs> no, it's already no. happened you and, know and David looks so feeble in that in that one too I mean he yes. David looks ferocious. Yeah, in the I have. I, speaking of, I have. Um, uh, I'm working on a follow-up to this, and there's a series of appendices. You know, the chapters are these long-form stories, but right. I also try to give people some real kind of practical how to walk through an art museum, how to look at a work of art. And in the the new book that's coming out, I, I have a, a, a an appendix called "I Don't Like Donatello and You Can Too." <laughs> I've always <laughs> and hated it's Donatello. It's, it, it's basically about how, what if there's art that is kind of esteemed in the eyes of the world and you just don't like it? You don't get oh, it. What do you, what do you do there? I don't know, but I've always thought it was such a misrepresentation. I mean, David had killed a lion and a bear with his hands, Yeah, according to the scriptures, right? Right. And, and Donatello's <laughs> David might be able to muster swatting a fly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's not much going on there. Not much going on there. All right. Let's talk about Caravaggio, mm-hmm. who... Uh, I don't know, a lot of people would say he's the most talented painter of all time. I don't know how many make that assertion. I will say I, I walked into a Caravaggio exhibition by accident in one of the major cities of the world 20 years ago. I mean, it just took my breath away. Yeah. I'd seen his work on, you know, reproduced any number of times. But, I mean, the 15 by 20 foot paintings and the colors are just astonishing even hundreds of years later. But uh, he's quite the rake and gambler and ruffian and brawler and 
killer, probably killed several people. Yeah, I mean, murderer, yeah. Yeah, 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 not just killed them, and he murdered them. And uh, I have to say that I read a piece once that tried to make the case that Caravaggio was converted after he was expelled from Rome. That was pretty weak, and I looked into it a little bit, and I'm pretty sure you don't buy it, but no. um, you do like to talk about it. I'm going to, can I just quote you to yourself, page yes, sure. 53, and on page 53, you make a, just a fascinating statement. You say, Caravaggio was drawn to life-changing moments in Scripture, like when the risen Jesus guided Thomas's dirty finger into the open wound in his side, or when Saul fell off his horse struck by the power and presence of Christ, converting him without warning, or when Peter denied knowing Jesus in the very moment his Lord was being handed over to die. Those are some of his great paintings. Then you say this, Caravaggio gravitated towards situations where the sacred confronted the profane, and he was moved by the power of Christ to change people's heart. The theme of the sinner's need for rescue and Christ's power to give it runs throughout his entire body of work. It was a story he told over and over again throughout his entire life, here's the payoff, presumably because he kept needing to hear it. And and you say a moment later that he seemed to live in only two places, Carnival and Lent. Yeah, he's... One of the reasons I was so drawn to write about Caravaggio as I got to know his story Mm. was I think that any one of us can relate to the feeling of being this paradox of the sacred and the profane, Um, that that there are parts of us that that feel intensely pure at times, and then there are parts of us that feel intensely dark and twisted at times, and they they live inside of us. It's the Apostle Paul, you know, talking about the two two competing versions of himself inside his own heart, you know. Um, that Caravaggio is is a caricature of that. He's a person where we see it in extremes, where we see the tenderness and the clarity of his interpretation of biblical passages and stories, particularly in the New Testament of Jesus. And then him brawling and, and drinking and, and carousing and, and living as though it's his world and everybody else is just living in it and suffering as a result of it and having to you know kind of live as a as a as a refugee as an escape as an escaped convict uh try, evading the law for the rest of his life and and trying to understand how can these two things both live in the same person they're happening simultaneously he's painting mm-hmm. these paintings while he's living this way but so just to make it clear you mean painting yeah. these paintings of god's grace of god calling matthew for example yeah. who yeah. is you know the equivalent roughly of an, a russian spy today mm-hmm. yeah and and it's just this tremendously potent call it's, it yeah, seems so. to know it perfectly or the the finger you know, if Thomas yeah. ready to go into the side of Jesus, poised, does he need to do it or not? And with just such depth of understanding. Yeah, it's it's it, and so for me, I I, I wanted to basically uh, just bother myself and bother readers with the question of what do you do with something like this? Mm-hmm. Like, do you do you do you say, well, obviously, he's a person who is beyond the reach of the mercy and grace of God because of the evidence of how he lived his life, or do we say, well, we don't. We don't know what in his heart of hearts he he believed to be true about the mercy of Jesus that he depicted as somebody who, when he when he translated it onto canvas, it, it was it was touching and it was moving mm-hmm. and it was because then you know then we have to start thinking about our own sin and our own you know struggles and then people that we might look at and think well that person is is just far too gone for for mm-hmm. the mercy of. Of God, Caravaggio is he's, he's a riddle for me in that, and he's a, and he and and his story humbles me to say, mm-hmm. man, I, uh, there's there's evidence of a knowledge of the grace of Jesus, and there's evidence of a despising of of the holiness of God in his life, all kind of wrapped up into one, and um, and it, and he's a he's a complete paradox and riddle to me. And he didn't write. We don't know what he would no. touch, right? So. No, he's he's one of those characters where. Most of the historical artifacts we have on him are either paintings or police records. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't know what he was thinking. So uh, so the first three people we've talked about, and they're all early in the book, Van Gogh, Michelangelo, or Michelangelo, however you like to say it, and Caravaggio, were all tortured souls. I conclude, therefore, that you are drawn to tortured souls. Uh, they, those are the best stories. <laughs> <laughs> 
Are your friends tortured souls? No. No. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, or aren't we all? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I used to think I was, and now, now I'm like, I'm not really. I have a pretty good situation. But, 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 but I am, I am drawn to, I'm drawn to, to people where they're known for their struggles and there's no hiding it and they have to navigate it and they have to tell the truth about it. So I, it does remind me, you alluded to this, that, you know, we have paintings and songs and poems and parables. I mean, Jesus' parables are, have some pretty tortured souls in them. Yeah. And they're short stories, but they do convey sometimes real anguish. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I'm preaching through parables right now. I'm preaching mm-hmm. on the Pharisee and the tax collector this coming Sunday. And, um, I, you know, the way that, the way that Jesus frames those stories and part of the brilliance of how they work as though Jesus needs me to tell him he's brilliant, uh, is, is, is the way that they end with an ellipsis more than a period, you know, mm-hmm. that, that they leave you having to wonder what happened. The like, prodigal son, great story, yeah, right? right? Where, where, yeah. where you've got the, you, the elder brother and the father telling him to come in. And we don't know if he ever does it or not. Yeah, we don't know. And that's mm-hmm. part of the point of the parable right. is, is the invitation has now been extended. What are you going to do with it? Right. Um, Flannery O'Connor said one time, she said, a story is a way of saying something that can't be said any other way. They take in all this nuance and complexity and ask questions, make statements, confuse, redirect, excite, you know, all that stuff. It mm. Kind of all, and it all happens instantly. Well, uh, thanks. We're going to take a little break to say things that need to be said. And when we get back, we're going to talk about Vermeer and the Hoppers. Oh, ooh. Hi, I'm John Perkins, Executive Director of the Center for Faith and Work St. Louis. You've been listening to Working with Dan Doriani, a podcast production of the Center for Faith and Work St. Louis. In addition to the podcast, the Center equips Christian leaders to run 10-hour faith and work cohorts on three continents. And we also offer conferences on faith and work throughout the United States. Our goal is to equip both formal and informal leaders to make a difference in their corner of the world. Please visit our website at faithandworkstl.org to see how your church or organization can form a faith and work cohort. At the end of today's interview, stay tuned to hear how participating in one of CFW's cohorts inspired Margie McKechnie to make a difference in Cape Town, South Africa. Now, back to Dan. All right, welcome back. I would love to talk to you about another um, tortured soul situation, and that is Edward Hopper and his wife, Jo. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to quote something you said there, too. So Edward Hopper, in case you don't know it, is is that author that does the paintings, I'm going to call them austere, isolated, forlorn, I don't know. Very lonely, very lonely. lonely. You know, the, what's the name of the, I forget the name of it right now, the diner. Nighthawks. Night, Nighthawks, right. Um, and he was married to a woman who was an artist in her own right, has been rediscovered to some extent uh, some years after she died and after a proper desire to have more attention paid to women who are artists but he got so much more attention during their life and she became his manager and they fought all the time it says that you write that joe joked on their 25th anniversary that they deserved a medal for distinguished combat for making it that far and she was the model for the great majority of his females and uh, he has a sketch in which she's leaning over him, wagging her fingers in his face as he reclines his head back. I'm quoting now. Hands pressed together, pleading in prayer beneath the drawing he wrote, he cannot choose but hear. And she said, sometimes talking to Eddie is like dropping a stone in a well, except that it doesn't thump at the bottom. So great painter, painter of isolation and, and pain. And he lived a painful life. Yeah. He was proud like a lot of painters, great people are, and yet he endured, his wife endured with him. Uh, why did you want to tell that story? So from the time I was young, uh, when I was in high school, I had an art teacher who really wanted, small town Indiana, uh, this art teacher really wanted us to develop a lifelong affection and appreciation for art. And she told us, find an artist that you connect with and then just pay attention to them for the rest of your life. And they will they will tell you their story. They'll introduce you to their friends and colleagues. They'll be hanging on the wall next to them in museums. And it'll be a way that you'll you'll learn to love and understand art by way of understanding the artists themselves. And she would take us to the Chicago Art Institute once a year. 
which was a couple hour bus ride from where, where I lived. And, uh, and in that museum is Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, that famous painting of the cafe at, at night. And I always loved that painting. And so as I discovered other paintings by him, I began to notice that they were all very lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're all mostly set in New York, uh, or at least a lot of them are set in New York City. And and he makes it look as though the person in the canvas is the only person there. Right, Desolate. If there is somebody, you know, and, and oftentimes it was his wife. Mm -hmm. And so uh, out of curiosity, and that's how a lot of the chapters in this book, all the chapters in this book came because I was just curious about these artists. So I didn't, I didn't know the stories typically before I started researching them. Uh, to, for the for, for the chapters, and so I, I wanted to. Tr I thought that I was going to discover with Edward Hopper. Here's a person who has a a keen wisdom about the subject of human loneliness. Mm. Here's a person who's going to have some really insightful things he's trying to say about the problem of loneliness. And what I discovered is, no, he he was more just kind of a miserable person, kind of cruel and mean to other people. And he painted the world as he experienced it, um, not so much because he was he was complaining about it, but it was kind mm -hmm. of like what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And his wife was his muse. She was in all of the paintings. And so there's so many paintings where there's just her. And when they married, she was a more successful painter than he was. And she asked at one of her exhibits if they would be willing to let her husband show some of his work too. They weren't married yet. And he quickly gains a lot of uh, critical acclaim and then mm -hmm. pretty soon eclipsed her uh, critically. And then she ended up supporting him in his career and kind of just stopped painting for mm -hmm. the most part. And, uh, and so he created this world for her that was intensely lonely for her. And then he painted her in it, uh, in these paintings. And so you're seeing something. And, and so... Part of the point of that chapter was was really that chapter is as much about Joe yes, as it is, it is. about Edward, yeah. um, and it's about the complexity of their marriage and her, and it was a different time than now, um, where you know in our day and age people would be much more quick to just get a divorce, but in those right. days it was a little it was a little different, and so they 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 had this kind of strange partnership where she endured it, uh, and he benefited tremendously from her support but generally wasn't kind to her in public or, mm -hmm. or any, anything like that. And so right. and it, it, was a, it was an interesting story to tell because in a way he is making some pretty profound statements about loneliness and uh, the, the, that thing inside of us that wants to push people away and then what it means for, for what the world will be like, not only for ourselves, but for those people as well um, that are joined to it. And, and uh, yeah, that, that chapter can, kind of lands with a thud. Yeah, um, it's a hard you know, one. Yeah, um, yeah. You might say that he taught us about loneliness even though he wasn't trying. Yeah, that, yeah. But that's kind of the, I don't know, it's part of what I picked up from the chapter. Let me move to the happier chapter. Okay. The Impressionists. As I read your book, I thought, this is an anonymous society of rejects. Yes. Who decided to hang together and change the art world by stepping outside of the normal channels, the salon and the prizes and the contests. They essentially decided that they were good, whether anybody thought so or not, and they decided to reform and resist, and they were successful. Yeah, they're they're. I mean, the closest analogy we have today is they're indie artists. They're mm -hmm. they're the the independent rock bands that that put on their own festivals and and go on the road and play at all the colleges and build their fan bases without the major major record labels behind them. Right. Um. And then they and then they get to do things on their own terms. And then the world catches up to them later, you know, mm -hmm. and says, oh, these guys are legends <laughs> mm -hmm. when, when in fact, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a cycle that's repeated itself. It repeats itself all the time. I mean, that's Ecclesiastes, right? There's, there's right. nothing new under the sun. We, right. when something new and untested comes along, uh, we fear it. And so we criticize it. Uh, and in its unfamiliarity, we say, because it's unfamiliar, it's not good. The strength of, of the story that I'm trying to tell in that chapter is, is what made it work was these artists had to agree together to be a community, right. uh, to support each other, to promote each other, to encourage each other. And uh, what's fasc what was fascinating to me to discover was that they were all friends. I mean, we're talking right. about Monet, Manet, Renoir, mm -hmm. Pizarro, 
Jean Frederick Bazile, who's the subject of the chapter, but yes. he, he died early. I, can I? I just want to make sure. I want to. Uh, I don't cry during the reading of a book of history very often. But I was moved. I was. Are moved you telling me you cried? You cried reading this book? Tiny bit, little bit. It doesn't happen much. But the Bazile story is just astonishing. So I want to draw you out on that, if I may. Yes. So you point out that the group had no hierarchy, no appointed leader. Everybody labored together, used their gifts, and respected each other. I mean, it's the antithesis of the Hopper story, right? Yes. Yes. Um, but Bazile volunteered for a war and took on a daunting challenge in the Franco-Prussian War. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just commenting on pages 120 and 120, 121 and 122, and launched an assault that he felt was necessary and was killed. And then his friends decided to honor him. And I'm not going to tell it. I want you to tell it because it's just so beautiful. So he painted this painting called Studio 9 Rue de la Condamine, uh, which is a painting of his studio in that paint, which he shared with his fellow painters, including sharing supplies and, and, and um, camaraderie. And in that painting is Monet and Manet and Renoir and the poet Emile Zola and another friend of theirs um, who was a musician is seated at a piano. And on the walls are some of Bazile's painting, but paintings, but also some of Monet's paintings and some of Renoir's. And Bazile came from money, and he would he would buy paintings from Monet to help Monet stay afloat. Uh, and he would you know so he would do these kinds of things for his friends as a way of saying we're in this together and we're supporting each other. Bazile did not in the painting original version of the painting, Manet and Monet are standing in front of an easel looking at one of Bazile's paintings, and after the fact. Manet. After the fact of his death, that is. Yeah, after the fact right. of his death, Manet painted Bazile into the painting, standing between Manet and Monet and the easel. And now you can't see the painting on the easel anymore because all you can see is the frame of their friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they put him into his painting, which, mm -hmm. which he left himself out mm -hmm. um, as a way of honoring him as, as, their, as their captain. Mm. I mean, it gives me chills. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's such, a, such a great story. It's friendship, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the kind of friendship that comes with saying, we work in the same field. We likely would have the same customers and buyers. But what matters most is that the work that we're doing is life-giving and sustainable. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we, if, if we do this as a community and we have friends to come alongside each other. And that community knew there was no other way uh, for them to, to do their work in the way that they felt like they were called to do it than to, than to bind themselves together. And so well, they did. And, and Bazile was a big part of that. And what's so terrific is that, you know, there was enough, uh, I'll say, uh, socioeconomic sense in mm -hmm. them that their work made it to the world instead of getting lost, which happens to so much great work, whether it's musical or otherwise. Yeah. And then they honored their friend. So the book is called Rembrandt in the is in the wind. Rembrandt is in the wind, and there is of course a chapter about Rembrandt. We we don't have a ton of time, so it's largely a chapter about the theft of of one of his great paintings. But let me ask you to tell us why Rembrandt, who was probably the most robust Christian of the people you discuss, why did he paint himself into his paintings? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, yeah. This was a way, Rembrandt did it a lot. Um, a lot of Renaissance painters would do this. It was a trick, and it was a way of breaking the fourth wall to bring mm -hmm. the viewer into the scene. And so he would, he painted himself, the particular painting that I write about there is The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, which was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in 1990. And along with 12 other works of art, and they haven't been recovered since. And so that's where the title comes from, right? He's in the wind. But, but, but also in the painting, right. the disciples are all in the boat, and the boat's being tossed in the storm. And half storm of them, and sea in Galilee, they're worried yeah, about dying, right? Yep, yep. And they're, so they're trying to wake up Jesus to see if he'll mm -hmm. help them. And in the middle of the disciples, there's one who's wearing a blue 
jacket and a ber- and he's and a beret and he's got his hand on his head uh, and he's <laughs> holding a rope and he's looking at you he's looking mm-hmm. at the viewer and that's Rembrandt mm-hmm. and so he painted himself into this dire situation mm-hmm. where the question being posed to Jesus is don't you care that we're perishing here mm-hmm. and he's looking at us as a way of bringing us into the storm and bringing us into the boat and putting the question on our lips as well um, and so it's it's a uh, whenever you see a painting where one of the characters is looking at you, the viewer, the odds are pretty good that it's the, it's a self-portrait of the painter mm-hmm. talking to you uh, about the story that he's telling in, in inside the frame. And Rembrandt, I, I got to sit with uh, one of Rembrandt's self-portraits in the National Gallery in D.C. for, I don't know, half an hour, uh, just looking at that one painting. And he paints himself as a 53-year-old who looks like he's 78. <laughs> And, and it's also painted in such a way that wherever his eye goes, it looks like he's looking at you. So yeah. it's like, you cannot escape your finitude. You cannot escape your mortality, seems to be what he's saying. He was full of messages. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. was. He's a fascinating study, too, because he painted for a long time. And so if you look at his early work compared to his older work, mm. uh, you actually see, um, he reminds me of Paul Simon in this way, where, where there's a body of work that, mm. that changes over time. Right. Uh, that starts off with this kind of swagger and this confidence. And, and these I'm painting these paintings just so that everybody's clear what I'm capable of. Yeah, right. You know, and then when he's older, like with the last painting he ever painted, um, is of Simeon holding the Christ. Uh, and it's, it's just this kind of modeled painting, very warm painting of an old man holding a baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's it. And we painted it when he was 24, the same scene. It's this ornate architecture of the temple, and there's like 50 people, and there's this beacon of light coming down and the priests have his arms yeah it's just it's it's got no intimacy or warmth but it'll Mm -hmm. dazzle you yeah um but at the end of his life you know that paint that early painting it's like he's trying to show you what he can do right uh and in the last one it's like it's like he's an old man who just wants to hold jesus and or he's showing you what he feels we could say not what he does but what's going on in his soul yeah yeah Yeah. i'm going to give you a challenge vermeer (laughs) very odd career he his his famous paintings are, are almost nothing like his earlier paintings mm-hmm. just tell us give us a, a quick word because we're almost out of time yep. give us a quick word about how technology helped yeah. him and and why you wanted to tell the story sort of a pro-technology chapter about vermeer it is yeah that's a great way to say it is it's a pro-technology chapter is it cheating to use technology to help yourself create art I wrote the chapter before AI was that much mm-hmm. of a thing, so I don't know what I would say about that at this point. But yeah. I was at a used bookstore. I found a, a book called The Complete Works of Vermeer, and mm-hmm. it was very thin. Uh, yeah. There's like 36 paintings that he's painted uh, that, that we know of. Uh, and as I was flipping through the book, I had this weird sensation of something's off, I, and I can't figure out exactly what it is. And then I realized, oh, all the paintings are basically of the same room with the right. same window from the same chair – and and it's he's just painting the same thing over and over and over again with just different scenes happening. But it's the yeah, same room. Different people doing slightly different things. But yes, and and so I was what what is going on with that? <laughs> and um, by the way, I just was in Amsterdam earlier this year, and they they had a Vermeer exhibit at the mm. Rijksmuseum where where right. um, twenty nine of the thirty six paintings were there. Mm. So I got to see them all kind of together, which was great. Um, but it, it, it what he did is he created a um, an optical device where he was uh, kind of setting up an actual scene and painting it by way of a lens and a mirror. Um, he was painting basically a, a copy mm-hmm. of what was actually showing up in the mirror that he was looking at. And, um, and so there's this incredible detail that's in mm-hmm. these paintings that I could not figure out. How did right. he achieve this kind of detail? And it has been a mystery as to how he did it. Um, there was a documentary that came out not that long ago called Tim's Vermeer, uh, put out by Pendulet of uh, Penn and Teller, about a guy who was trying to figure out what Vermeer did. Mm-hmm. And he created a studio and he created a device and he was going to, basically his goal was to paint a Vermeer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the trick was he was not a painter. Um, mm-hmm. So he was going to figure out the technology of it to, to where he could actually paint a Vermeer painting just like Vermeer did. It was pretty good. He, was yeah, he gets in the kinda, ballpark, um, yeah. but he but he but he figured it out. But it's yeah. but it, it's a reflection for me on we all stand on the shoulders of people who have come before us. I mean, even to have this podcast interview, we're both speaking into microphones and and right. 
signals are being sent into outer space and somehow our voices are being captured right. on some kind of digital format. And, and they even sound like us. <laughs> yeah, and they and they sound like us. And, and it's, it's um, you, you know, part of the, the forum in which we get to create now, whether it's art or parenting or cooking or whatever our vocations are, the places where we go and we apply our creativity, uh, there's a lot that's been done to kind of set us up to do it right. in the way that we get to do it now. And for Vermeer, he was he was an early adopter of of finding people who knew how to do things and using their skills right. to bring to bear in the art that he was painting, yeah. painting Objects. like the yeah. like the lens maker, um, yeah. Anthony Van Leyenhock, who who yeah. lived in his town, the father of microbiology, who who made microscopes and mm -hmm. who likely made lenses yeah. for Vermeer to use for his optical device. Yeah, which Crazy. we don't know, but it sure makes sense. When yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, you know, it's a complicated uh, story, complicated chapter. So one more time, I'll recommend the book. Uh, Russ, it's always good to visit. I always yeah. enjoy uh, talking. I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. Because uh, the book manifestly shows hard work and lots of research and meditation. You're a good writer, but that doesn't happen by accident. You're also a pastor. So, I mean, who's going to become a lay art historian, theological reflector, somebody with a lot of energy? So question one, what do you do to relax? Do you work all the time? I write <laughs> to oh. relax. <laughs> um, and I hike. I okay, walk. good. Yeah, I'm a body in motion. All right, that's good. Um, some of our best ideas come while we're walking. If you could do anything to relax for an entire year, what would you do? Uh, I would do the Triple Crown. I would hike the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide, and the Pacific Crest Trail. Can you do all, all in three one in one year? Well, that's, that's yeah, that's, that's, there's a name for it. I don't think I'd be able to do it. Okay. Um, it's Maybe called if the you did one, you'd be in shape to do number two, and then you'd collapse for number three. <laughs> right, or I'd be, or I'd be just kind of falling over after the first one. No, I would, I would go do the Pacific Crest Trail. I'd okay. start there. Yep. Okay, that's great. Yep, that'd be, and it's that's a no-brainer. That's what I would do. Oh, that's good. Again, a pleasure to have you with us, uh, friends. I recommend all the works of Russ Ramsey, but especially Rembrandt is in the wind. Theological reflections on the intriguing characters who have major talent and have stories to tell. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. It's fun to be here. This is a great conversation. We're thankful for today's guest and also extend special thanks to our sponsor, the Alliance for Confessing Evangelicals. Please check out their site, Reformation 21. That's the principal host of this podcast. If you want to put your faith to work and change your corner of the world, visit our website, the Center for Faith and Work St. Louis. Look for faithandworkstl.org. That's one word. We'll help you start a cohort with like-minded believers who also want to practice their faith at work. This podcast is donor-supported. To keep us going, please donate on our website. Maybe more importantly, you can support us by listening, by subscribing, by sharing, by liking us, by posting us on your favorite platform, or go old school and tell a friend. My name is John Perkins, and uh, I am interviewing uh, Margie McKechnie, who recently completed one of the cohorts with Dan Doriani for Center for Faith and Work. And we're here today to just learn about her experience and have her tell us a little bit about herself and about her integration of her faith and her work. So Margie, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do vocationally. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my background is quite an interesting one. I am a qualified actuary by background, and uh, I specialized in health insurance. And so that's my my area of interest. And yet um, throughout my life, there's always been this underlying passion for education. Um, and I decided I wanted to go study so, so uh, towards being a teacher. And so made the transition into a high school and worked as a maths teacher for two years. They even post that. I uh, decided that I wanted to still be in the education space, but in a slightly more maybe academically rigorous is maybe the correct sort of phrasing, uh, sort of setting. And so I'm now at the University of Cape Town. I'm based in South Africa and I'm a lecturing actuarial science there. So that's my my background. So very um, mathematical, have a love for maths, but also have a very, very deep love for people. And in my job, try to combine those two things. 
Had you spent much time prior to Dan's class really thinking about how faith integrated with your particular vocation and your calling? Or was it something that previously existed, like there was faith in one sphere or bucket, if you will, and then what you did and what you practiced and what you studied in another area? Interesting question. I think a bit of both, to be honest. I think it's something as a Christian, and I've been a Christian since I was a young girl. So the the role that Jesus plays in in all the spaces uh, that I interact is, a, is something that's always front of mind for me. But I had thought about it in the workspace, and I think it was a big driver for me to actually move into education because of that love for people um, and how that sort of rings true with, with what the Lord calls us to. But I had never articulated, I think, those thoughts well to myself. And so it was a, a vague correlation in my mind, but maybe not a concrete uh, reasoning or argument to it. So so kind of in between, but that's part of what I found so helpful about the course was that it, it, it challenged me to put those thoughts to to paper in many, in many ways and also say, okay, am I actually living according to what I am professing to believe in the workplace? Mm, yeah, I think that uh, your phrase vague correlation is probably pretty common among a lot of believers. I mean, they're, yeah. you know, I, I think we tend to bifurcate these things and they sort of exist in different parts of our lives. And the intersection and the bringing together of them is such a fundamentally important one, but one that we just don't really know how to do. So I'm curious, you said that the class kind of helped you start to think through it and, and coalesce these things into one. So talk a little bit about that and like the way in which it impacted you particularly. Very much so. Um, I think the big thing for me was just the structure that the course took. I think getting that um, work that makes a difference uh, book and going through that and the structure that each chapter took and and then thinking through the questions that were positioned at the end of each chapter and actually really spending some time reflecting on that was very helpful for me because it, it put it into a structure. And I think, you know, often we can have thoughts and we kind of, you know, think them and it's off the wall and you never really give them any any connection into your overall being. That's what the 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 faith and work course did, is it said, okay, here's a series of questions structured, very well thought through, very well researched. Um, and and what what are you doing with this? Is is this something you thought about? Is it not something you thought about? And so I started doing that. And I think if you have any form of personal integrity, you realize that once you, you've you realized the truth, um, you now have to apply it to your life. And so that was really helpful um, because it bedded down a lot of those things in my mind and and therefore had a big impact on, on the work that I do. So project, you completed a project, which is a, a really important key part of what the cohort does. So tell us about the project and tell us the current status of the project. So my project was something that I never in a million years thought I would do. So I started a podcast specifically on actuarial science. So the the heart behind the podcast is, and sort of the tagline is to demystify the art of the actuary. So so the whole point is to create a community for people who um, either are interested in actuarial science, in studying actuarial science or qualified as actuaries. And to create this dialogue saying, you know, what is it that you do there's lots of sort of seeming barriers to entry. What are those? And then just drawing people in from different sort of spaces saying, you know, there's only not one, what, it's not only one type of person that can be an actuary. There's lots of different types of people that can be an actuary. So the heart behind it was creating community for a group of people that uh, seem to be very elitist. And yet um, what's been great about it is I've released a number of podcasts already and we've got over 2000 listens and it's been amazing. And, and the, the input um, that people and the encouragement that people have got from it has been astounding. And, and, it's, and it's been incredible also to just, you know, interview some of my, my, my counterparts and people in my networks who I had no idea what their journeys were, you know, and, and the podcast always starts. It's like, what's your journey? How did you get here? And I sit there in awe being like, I didn't know you struggled with that. And and right. and it's amazing for people who have just started the journey of wanting to become an actuary to say, oh, there's actually people who also struggled and, and look at them now, they're fine, you know, and there's an element of almost mentorship that comes through in it. Um, so so it, it became so much bigger than I thought it would be, but there's a big education lens to it, which is obviously very important to me. There's a massive amount of love and passion that's been poured into it. And I think it's been incredibly beneficial to a wide group of people, which I never thought it would be. So that was my project. And had it not been for the sort of uh, prompt, I think, from from the course, I don't think I would have actually gone and done it. And it's been a lot of work, but I think it has been beneficial. 
Uh, Margie, thank you so much for your time today. This was awesome. So thank you so much. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for considering me. I uh, yeah. really hope that um, your listeners can benefit from something that I've said. <laughs>